morning. I invite you to stand and worship with us.
much that you have never failed.
you guys want to really mess with me, um, my sister and her family are coming this afternoon to visit, and she found out I made a couple of pecan pies uh, from our mom's recipe, and she said, you better buy one of your own pies, because I want to I want to help you eat it. So if you want to really mess with me and make me pay a lot of money for one of my pies, feel free to do it because we're just we're really raising money for the women. That's really what it's all about. And if you force me to do it, I'll write the check for whatever I have to uh, or face my sister. I'll have to go bake another pie, and I don't really want to do that. It'd be cheaper, but I don't want to do that. Um, this Wednesday at 10 a.m. and at 7 p.m., we have a morning class. We start our fall Bible study class on spiritual warfare. And uh, there is a clipboard in the back if you want to sign up for the morning class. We've got enough that we're going to do it. We always try to see if there's an interest for a morning class. It'd be the same class, and uh, we want to encourage you to that. And then uh, we'll start. A, we're getting ready in the fall. We've been studying and working on a series of sermons that all of us will be preaching on the team, uh, the seven laws of the harvest or the laws of the harvest. And uh, so we're excited about that. And then I'm going to need some guys on next Saturday about one o'clock to help me reset the chairs because the ladies are going to have it set up for their brunch. And so any of you men that might be able to help me about one o'clock next Saturday, I would greatly appreciate it. Well, this morning, um, I was reading a story about a little boy in the first grade, and he was in the first grade Sunday school with, uh, with Mrs. Smith was his teacher, and she, he loved his Sunday school class, and every Sunday she would tell a Bible story, and then she would say, kids, the, the moral of the story is, and he just loved his teacher, but he went on to the second grade, he had to go to a different class, and he went to class, and um, his mom just wanted to know how it was going. After a couple weeks, she said, so uh, how do you like your new teacher? Well, the new teacher would tell Bible stories, but she wouldn't say, and the moral of the story is. And so he said, oh, she's okay. Well, what's just okay? He said, well, she's a pretty good teacher, but she has no morals. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm just determined to mess with you a little bit today. One of my favorite books, and it's one I don't loan out, I have my books I grab. I have a bunch of books right on my desk there that are favorite books, and then I've got a whole library besides, but this one's right there readily available to me. It's, it's The Divine Conspiracy by, uh, Deval by Dallas Willard, Rediscovering Our Hidden Life in God. It's an amazing book, and I want to share a quote out of it, a quick one. And he writes this in this book, what Jesus had to say about human good and evil was of sufficient depth, power, and justification to dominate European culture and its offshoots for 2,000 years. Nobody even has an idea of what Europe and the Western world would mean apart from Jesus and his words. It wasn't just what Jesus had to say about morality that changed the world forever. It was what Jesus had to do that changed everything. And that continues to change everyone who will believe on him. It's, it's an interesting thing that he says. And we, we can dredge up all kinds of examples of how awful the church really was in the dark ages and different times in history. But, but you can't deny the influence of the teachings of Jesus and, and, and the church, whether it was good or bad or, uh, or as Pastor Dan said last week, ugly, and sometimes it was, it was still the influence that shaped Western civilization. If we want to talk about how bad the church has been down through history, I want you just to, to look at how people live in nations that are not Christian nations. In uh, Islamic nations, I'm not going to, I don't want to discriminate and say bad things about that, but, uh, but the teachings of Jesus inform us how to treat other people. Whether we do it or not is one thing or another thing. But if everyone lived by the teachings of Jesus, we, we wouldn't need a lot of laws. We could, we could have ten. Or we could go with what Jesus said and have two. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we wouldn't even need laws. You'd go to the, you'd go to the stoplight, and there wouldn't be a stoplight. And everybody would just sit there looking at it. You know, everybody going, you go. No, you go. Well, maybe it's a good thing we have stoplights that change. <laughs> but everybody would be saying, no, you go first. Uh, nobody would get in line at the church potluck. No, you go first. No, I insist. You eat first, brother. No, I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't go until you go. I won't eat until after you've eaten. See, Jesus really, really has instructed Western civilization, his teachings, his word. And because of these things, we, we, when you think about when a country is in a disaster and a crisis, even though nations may not be quote-unquote Christian nations officially, it's those nations that have been instructed by the teachings of Jesus those are the nations that go and send all of the aid and the volunteers and the people to make a difference. This nation was formed by men who were informed by the teachings of Jesus and the authority of the Bible, God's Word. I know that I started to say you can't, you can't change history, but isn't it fascinating how history is being changed because history is being taught in a different way. Oh, the founding fathers weren't Christians. Oh, they were deists. Some of them were atheists. You know what? You read their writings. And you read the buildings on Washington, D.C. Carved in stone is the word of God and the teachings, the moral teachings of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read a couple scriptures and then we'll, we'll come back to them in, in a little bit. But Matthew 7, 13. Oh, the title of my sermon, Not Choosing, is a Choice. Not choosing is a choice. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. I want you to notice that in that scripture are two little words, many and few. Matthew 24, once again, the words of Jesus, verses 12 through 14, again, Jesus said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Once again, there's a word most, and, and right after that, the word the one who stands firm. Like I said, we'll come back to those scriptures in just a little bit. We're entering into another one of those extremely nasty periods of time in our country known as an election year. I, I kind of hate it. It just seems to get worse and worse. And I, so I want to I diverge here just a little, but I promise you I'm going where I'm going. And, and they'll help me. I'm going to get where I'm going, but I want to ask a series of questions. And I, the, this first point is that I, I, we want to understand our citizenship. Understand your citizenship. Right now, there's a focus on immigration reform, and there's the idea of, of the crisis at the border and should we build a wall and not build a wall and it just goes and, and it's just a huge debate uh, my question to you is are you a citizen of this country Amen. are you a citizen of this country I asked this question and I want to make this statement if you are a citizen of this country you have been blessed and you should thank God every single day because there are hundreds of millions of people that will risk their lives to come here to possess what many of us don't even appreciate. Are you a citizen of this country? We need to understand our citizenship. Through no work of your own, for many of you, some of you may have become citizens, but most of us were born citizens. We haven't done anything. It's not through our merit. It's not through our life accomplishment that we've been granted citizenship. You and I have done nothing to have what we have. And, and, and the worst thing that we can ever do is to be ungrateful for that. Second question, are you a Christian? 
Well, some of the same things apply. If the answer is yes, then you should daily thank God because you possess something eternal and priceless. Wow. Once again, through no effort of your own, I mean you believed, but Jesus did the work. Amen? Jesus paid the price, and we're Christians. So now I'm going to get really, I'm going to mess with you. I love this part. Are you an American Christian, or are you a Christian American? You're like, okay, what's, it's a trick question. Are you an American Christian or a Christian American? I want to emphasize uh, the emphasis here. Okay? Okay, I'm messing. I'll, let me get back to you. All of us, I think we more naturally say, and, and I, this isn't just a bad on all of us, but I think it's more true. If people would ask us this question, we'd say, well, I'm an American Christian. But I think it's important that maybe we say, I'm a Christian American. Some of you got it. Either answer is a wonderful thing because we're, we declare and we possess what I talked about in being a, a citizen and a, and a Christian. We, we are so doubly blessed with that. But I'm not talking primarily about your nationality or re, your religion here. Are you an American Christian? Are you a Christian America? Let me rephrase the question. In your worldview, how you see things, what are the guiding principles is your value system determined by the realities of your everyday surroundings? Or do you consciously seek to please God in all things? I want to tell you something that our independence as Americans is, is one of the things that's really great about this nation. And it's one of the things that makes it really, us really hard to be good Christians. We, we grew up with so many rights that many people don't have and, we, and, and it's a filter through which we see everything and, and we want everything to be fair, especially where we're concerned. You know? Oh, by the way, socialism, which is, is where we're heading. Socialism is exactly the most compassionate form of government there ever was unless you have a job and pay taxes. And then it's really bad. And everybody here pretty much does that. I shouldn't have thrown that in. That was free. <laughs> now, I'm going to go even further afield, but I know I'm going, I'm going to get back where I'm going. Is the United States of America a democracy or a republic? I read, well, not everybody agrees with you. I read about 14 articles this week until my brain turned to oatmeal. And I want to tell you, there's a huge disagreement in what, what are we? Now, we are, there are countries in the world that call themselves democratic republics, and they're not either. Amen. <laughs> they're dictatorships. But we're kind of this really odd, I, the, I couldn't answer the question because the people that really write these things can't seem to agree. Let me, let me just say what they are. And I stay with me on this. I have a point here. I will get there. I, I have one point. I'm going to get there eventually. If you're, if you're patient, if you feel like you're going to die, just go over and put a $100 bill and buy one of those pies, grab a fork out of the kitchen and eat a pie, and just stay with me. <laughs> and you'll be, don't, don't eat both of those pecan pies, though. A republic is guided by an overarching set of laws, a charter, a constitution, which in our country's case explicitly guarantees the individual's rights against the desire of the majority. Now I'm reading this straight out of, out of the, uh, uh, what, what is said as the definition. And it protects us and it allows us to have an indisputable right to think, worship, and vote any way we want. Now, a democracy, on the other hand, a true democracy allows the majority to rule and to disregard the desires of any individual who doesn't agree with them. Let me illustrate what a democracy 
a republic is where we elect people and they go write laws. And, and, and our, our founding fathers, you know, I don't know how many million people were in the 13 colonies, but they realized all of a sudden that at the Continental Congress, not every single citizen could go and voice their opinion. And, and just think right now, we send, what, a thousand people to Washington and they can't do anything. Imagine if 100 million people went to Washington. So a, a true democracy doesn't, it's hard to make that, that work, and our founding fathers understood that. And yet, in, a, in our thinking, we go, well, it's a, it's a democracy. I have my rights, and my opinion counts. Not as much as you might think. <laughs> Think of a democracy, a true democracy. is If the majority of your neighbors voted to paint all of the houses in your neighborhood bright red, you would have to paint your house bright red. Is everybody okay with that? No. No, I didn't think so. I didn't think you would be okay with that. While Americans set up to be, is set up to be a republic in its form of representative government, most Americans see the country as a democracy. And that's, a, that's just a, a, a real problem. They truly believe that the fairest form of government is that everybody gets to decide everything. Where did they get that idea? Oh, in grade school. We're taught, hey, it's fair, you know. We're going to make a decision on whether we're going to go to the museum for our field trip or to the zoo. How many people want to go to the zoo? Okay. How many people want to go to the museum? And so we, we go, oh, that's the fairest way to do everything. Let's just find out. And the people that didn't want to go to the museum, too bad. <laughs> we voted. And that's all there is to it. Why am I discussing this on a Sunday morning in church, you're wondering? And be honest, you're wondering. Now let's get down to where I think I want to go with this. Because evangelical Christianity in our country is becoming a smaller and smaller segment in our society. Christians are having less and less say about the direction and the morals of our nation. If you don't think so, move to Colorado. Oh, you already live in Colorado. You don't like some of the things that are happening? Well, guess what? There's not a lot you can, you can vote the next time you vote. But there's this sense of, oh my goodness, what, how, can we, how can we recapture all of this? Well, it, it has to do, it's not a political battle, it's a moral battle. It's a cultural battle. It is a, it is a, a battle for the very existence of the soul of this nation. And, and how did this happen? Well, it's the church's fault. I want to read some things. I just picked a few of these things out of a Barna report. 1997, 22 years ago. It's worse now. This is what, uh, okay, they, they polled self-identified Christians and non-Christians. When it comes to morals or what is right and wrong, there are no absolute standards that apply to everybody in all situations. Non-Christians, 81% agreed with that statement. 70% of the Christians agreed that there's no moral standard that applies to everyone. Ooh. People are basically good. 89% of people that aren't Christians said that's true. 79% of Christians said that's true. People are basically good. Uh, God helps those who help themselves. That is in the Bible, you know. According to Archie Bunker, I know, you kids have no idea who Archie Bunkers. 83% of the sinners agreed with that, and 80% of the Christians agreed with that. Nothing can be known for certain except the things you experience in your own life. 61% of Christians agreed. The main purpose in life is enjoyment and personal fulfillment. 66% of Christians said that's true. Uh, let me give you two more here. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Two people could define truth in totally conflicting ways, but both could still be correct. 76% of Christians 
in 1997 believed that statement was true. Uh, I won't even read any more. There's a whole bunch of them. It's shocking. It's over 20 years ago, and it, it, it was a bellwether. It was a way of predicting where we're at today. Yeah, democracy. Always works for the majority. And, and I'll tell you something. We had the moral majority back in the late 79, I believe. Uh, Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson started the moral majority. They made, some, they made some impact in our country, in the direction of our country, and by the late 80s had disappeared. There's no more moral majority, folks. Well, Jesus clearly taught that the majority is always wrong. Let me say that again. Jesus clearly taught that the majority is always wrong. It's back to our two scriptures we started. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, that's a majority, isn't it? Well, when, when compared to the few, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Uncomfortable with being in the minority? If you're going to make a stand for God, you will be in the minority. Yep. You will be. Note again the words, many and few. Matthew 24, 12 through 14, we already read it, but let's read it again. Jesus said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then, then the end will come. There is an ending. For some, it's going to be a great ending. For others, not so much. Let me read something the Apostle Paul wrote. Philippians 3, 18 through 21, 4. As I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Many. Oh, there's that word again. Their destiny is destruction and their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Paul purposely chose the word citizenship. In the Roman Empire, there were citizens and non-citizens. And you were no one unless you were a citizen. Citizenship in Rome was one of the few things that would determine whether you were a slave or a free person. And citizenship was held dearly by those in the Roman world. But Jesus is saying we have to choose. The title of my sermon is that, that uh, to not choose, basically. Not choosing is a choice. So Jesus is saying to us, you, you have to choose. It's pretty normal for most of us to say, I don't really want to choose. Or I don't want to choose now. Uh, or I want to sort of choose, partially choose. I want to choose conditionally. But as Yoda from Star Wars would say, choose you must. <laughs> choose you must. Oh, three or four of you got that. We need to have a, I got all, the, all of them. We need to have a, a Star Wars marathon. It would absolutely not help us spiritually in any way whatsoever, but we could all bring food and it would be fun. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> what Jesus said basically is you can't stand at the wide and narrow gate for very long without choosing. Because in the passage of time, you are in reality moving in one direction or the other. This is just a fact. This is not, a, this is not a, a, a popular truth. This is not something that we like. All of us resist that. Our flesh resists that. But I'm standing here going, I'm not really choosing. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Because your life is moving. Your life is moving towards eternity. You're moving one direction or the other. You're on the wide road. You're on the narrow road. 
Oh, no, I'm not. I'm out in the field between them. No, you're not. Jesus does not give us that option. You say, I'm not ready for the narrow gate, then you have chosen the wide gate. The words of Jeremiah 6.16, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Oh. And I suspect that that's what's happened with Barna's study on why Christians believe there's no such thing as an absolute moral right and, and that you and I could have completely, you could say black and I could say white and, it's, and we're both right. Such moral confusion. So know your citizenship, point number one. Point number two, oh, and that was a long one. The next two are short, just to give you hope. Be part of the minority. That's a choice. We're running around wanting our rights. We're running around wanting to be part of the majority. We're wanting, running around wanting to be like everyone else. There was a story of an elderly man who was out on, uh, he was out on I-70 uh, coming home. He's, his wife knew that he's coming home from the market, and, and she saw a news report that some, somebody was driving the wrong way on I-70. And so she calls him. And I know he had a hands-free phone because you would never answer the phone in traffic. And she said, Herman, are you coming home? Are you, on the, are you on the interstate? Yes, I am. She goes, I just saw a report that there's a vehicle going the wrong way. He said, oh, honey, the problem is much worse than they told you. There are hundreds of people going the wrong way. <laughs> hey, you guys are pretty sharp for being into this like 15 minutes or so. You're, you're doing good. You're, I think you're still with me. Choosing the narrow road honestly can be uncomfortable. It can feel like we're going against society, that we're going against culture, that it, it can feel like, man, I am, I'm out of step with everyone else. But did Jesus say the majority is always right? No. Jesus basically said the majority is always wrong. We need to be part of the minority. We choose to be part of the minority. When you truly live your life as a citizen of heaven, it may feel wrong in the natural. You may have to make decisions that do not make sense up here to your friends and family. People will tell you you are wrong. Friends may treat you as if you've lost your mind. You are driving against traffic on the interstate according to the unmoral or immoral majority. I'm here to tell you this morning, and this is part of my job, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Heaven is a choice. I've done over... I figured one time over 900 funerals, and that was a couple years ago. I am I'm much older than I look. No, I've actually pastored in little towns where at times I was the only pastor. I've done every kind of funeral you can imagine. I've done some really strange ones. I've done some really sad ones. And I've done some real joyous ones for those people that have chosen the narrow, the narrow gate. And I want to tell you, funerals are... Much of funerals are predetermined by the choice of which road you take and which road you lead your children and your grandchildren down. But heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people and there is a citizenship there that, that you are born with when you're born again. When you get born again, and what do we mean by that? We, that you take a point in time and you... you Trust Jesus for your salvation. You quit trying to be a good person and you allow him to help you, live through you, please him, and you become a good person. Much better than if you tried to just do it on your own. Heaven is a place that has citizenship and all are invited 
to participate. All are invited to come. And then the last point, God in one person makes a majority. Never forget this. God's word is always true. Always. God's word is always true. Always. Yes, I did intentionally use the word always twice. Because we've got to remember that. We have to remember. Moses chose to suffer with God's people rather than to avail himself of all of the riches and the power of Egypt. Egypt was the most powerful nation at the time. Moses was raised in the royal household. Moses was raised in privilege and wealth. And he made a choice to take the narrow road. The three Hebrew children chose a fiery furnace over the safety of numbers in Babylon's sinful and corrupt society. And they basically said, you, you can throw us in the fiery furnace and our God may deliver us. He may not, but we will not bow down. We will not bow down, even if it costs our lives. Peter and John defied the powerful Jewish leaders uh, at the risk of death, and finally they did die for this. They refused to discontinue preaching and healing the sick in Jesus' name. We'll let you guys go this time, but you had better not preach in that name of Jesus. And they said, well, we can't do that. We can't stop preaching in the name of Jesus. We can't stop healing in the name of Jesus. It's not our fault thousands of people are getting healed every day and saved every day. It's not our, I mean, we're not doing it. We're gonna, we have to do this. They let them go and the church began to pray, not for safety or protection. The church began to pray for boldness to even proclaim the G, name of Jesus more. That's, that's the narrow road. That's the, that's the power of being part of a church. We are a counterculture. We who meet in this building, those who meet in other buildings in the name of Jesus, if they will not compromise, if they will choose the narrow road, if they will trust Jesus and go, go the wrong way on the interstate because God said, we create a counterculture. We also create a fellowship of people that say, you know what, I'll make the right choice, you make the right choice, and we'll stand together. It's a powerful thing, powerful thing. One of the best examples of this that I can think of is in Numbers 13, and it's a sending out of the, it, it's sending out 12 um, spies to see if God actually said what he said. Not a great strategy, but hey, you know, when you're getting ready to do something important, sometimes you've got to put a fleece out, you've got to ask, you've got to pray, you've got to go back and pray, got to go back and pray. <laughs> Moses is standing at the Red Sea, and he's, he's praying again. God's like, stop praying and start going. <laughs> but we like to, don't? How many of you pray the big things? You pray a few times. I do. Oh, I think I better pray again. Okay, you want me to do that, God? I think I'll pray one more time. I think I'll send out the spies and see if God really meant what he said. He, what he meant. Numbers 13, 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. Later in the chapter, when they go out, they come back. Doom and gloom. Despair, we can't do it. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explore devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there are of great size. Caleb and Joshua, as a tiny minority, I mean, really small minority, chose the right path. They had faith when the others did not, and they inherited the land. They were the only two from their generation to go in and take the land. Hebrews eleven six says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 
You see, Caleb and Joshua's faith was not a hunch. It, was, it wasn't a feeling that there might be a chance that this will work out eventually. No, theirs was a faith based on what God had said and what God had done. What had God said? God said, I am going to give you this land. That was the promise that God gave them. And his word is the final word on everything. God's word is always true. Always. Never without an exception. Widely known as the father of existentialism, the 19th century uh, Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard wrote, Many religious beliefs are logically absurd and self-contradictory. He goes on and writes, and he uses the Trinity, which none of us really understand, and the dual nature of Christ, which none of us can quite explain, that Jesus is both God and man. And then he says, there comes a time when a man must make a leap of faith. There comes a time when we're looking at the narrow road. We're looking at the wide road. The, the, the narrow road to the human mind doesn't make a lot of sense. And what makes it really hard is almost everybody else is going over there. But down through history, people have chosen the narrow road. We know their names. We know the incredible impact that they have had on the course of human history. Because I want to tell you that with God, God in one is a majority. What had God done for the Israelites? Why, why was this not just a leap of blind faith? Well, Joshua and Caleb put their faith in God, the God who had visited plagues upon the Egyptians. They put their faith in a God who had delivered the children of Israel from the Red Sea. Theirs was not a leap of blind faith into theological acceptance of truths too lofty to understand. They were betting that this God who had already done things that were so far beyond their imagination was going to be able to keep his word. And I guess I had a lot of questions to ask you this morning. But I guess this might be the most important one of all. What has God done for you? When we begin to think, when we begin to weigh. You were born in America. Some of you have fought for this country. Some of you have sacrificed. Most of us, many of us have not. Even those that have. We, we, were, we had no say about being born here. Number one country where people want to be citizens, it seems. What has God done for you? You're an American. What has God done for you? You're a Christian. And those two things in, in are all the blessings for this life and the blessings for the life to come. And so when we put our faith, when God says, go on the narrow road, we are, we are going with the, the God who has done incredible things for us. How many of you have ever been healed from something? Yeah. If you look out all over this place, how many of you had a financial answer to prayer? God has just done something for you and you ask and he did it. We could go on and on down the list. Uh, there's very few of us here that God hasn't done some amazing things for. And so going on the narrow road is betting that God is greater than the majority. Going down the narrow road is betting that God is able to keep his promises. Amen? And so I leave you with the benediction that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. I love this. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Let's read it together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Let's stand this morning. Lord, give us the courage. Lord, based on what you've done, based on what you've given to us, even though the world sees it as an illogical choice, we who are people of faith need to reaffirm that no matter what happens, we're going to choose the narrow path. And Lord Jesus, you said that we would be in the minority. This, this nation for, for many, many years enjoyed 
having a moral majority or a, a, a majority of people that went to church, people that believed that your word was the ultimate and uh, truth and the guide for every decision in life. But, but we've strayed from that. And oh God, I pray for a, a moral minority. I pray for a powerful minority in all of our churches to begin to rise up. And begin to take a stand. Begin to begin to to, to go down that that narrow path that says, "But though though none go with me, still I'll follow." I've decided to follow Jesus. Lord, the most beautiful part of that narrow road is that you are walking that narrow road with us. And and the tragedy of the wide road is is, is of course the ending. Where it leads, you said it leads to destruction, but, but, the, but the other side of that is that you never really walk with us as long as we're on the wide road. And so, Lord, we choose to walk with you. We choose to fellowship with you. We choose, even though we don't see the ending of either of these roads, we choose to believe when you tell us that there's destruction at the end of the wide path and that there's life eternal and citizenship in heaven at the end of the narrow path. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I ask, oh God, that you would give us the intestinal fortitude, the, the strength to make the right choice. And, and it's, it's the choices every day that we make that put us on the wide road or the narrow road. Lord, I pray that we would be, that we would determine that we are Christian Americans that our citizenship, uh, uh, even though we are citizens here, ultimately our citizenship is in heaven. And all of those things are laid up for us and waiting for us. And Lord, we once again, we pause and we give you thanks for giving us so much and doing so much for us. And oh God, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.